Bonjour, Sarah. How are you? Bonjour, Angry Ogre. So good to see you. Bonjour to everyone as they are coming in. Bonjour, Ginger. Mwah. You are my favorite flavor. Uh, bonjour again, Madame, Madame Proctor. So this is a true story. Uh, we've got the, Madame Proctor is in the room right now. Um, and uh, she's the only proctologist in the show. Uh, now, rumor has it that's uh, not actually true. She's not actually, that's just a clever name. But, you know, uh, I, 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 don't, I don't care what your hobbies are. It's honestly, it's a hobby of my own. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. Let's see. Uh, bonjour, the shy fox. So I'm assuming the shy fox, I'm sure that's, what is that? Uh, you, you're the, the scheduler, right? So bonjour, Lisa. Oh, mon dieu, all of these people in here. This is so exciting. This is so, I, I'm, I'm not sure that I can handle this many people at one, two, three, four, five, six people at once. Oh, mon dieu. All right. So if you haven't said hello yet, please say bonjour when you come in so that I know that you're here. Uh, I'm going to wait a little while for people to come in because I know that the, um, the system doesn't even allow people into the room until, uh, until the time has passed, until, until the time has, has, has shown up. So I'm going to wait. Um... You know, and I, uh, you know, I might find out, let's see, I'll, uh, you know, so, so sometimes I, uh, I'll, I'll ask this question uh, as people are, so, so, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll ask this question. So I do this show a lot at Comic-Cons, right? And, uh, and so or at Comic-Cons and at Renaissance Festivals, it's an interactive experience. I bring people up with me, um, you know, I, I, I make them my props. Uh, and so, uh, and so one of the questions that I ask people a lot when I'm getting ready to do this show is, um, how many people, uh, have met me at some point during, well, here's how I usually say it. I say, um, uh, by, uh, by raucous thunderous applause, how many of you have met me at some point during this weekend and therefore have some idea of how this show is going to go. Bonjour, Teresa. Seven, Teresa, seven eleven. All right. So you, that's seven eleven. That means that there are a lot of you, and people go in you a lot. I understand. Um, so yes, if you haven't said bonjour yet, please say bonjour so I know you're here, so I can say bonjour back to you. So yes, uh, I'll usually do like this. If, by raucous, thunderous applause, how many of you have met me at some point uh, this weekend and therefore have some idea of what this show is, is going to happen in this show? And there will usually be, you know, about half, two-thirds of the crowd is going to, to, to raucously applaud. Then, uh, then I say, all right, now by... Awkward raising of the hands and diverting of the eyes. How many of you haven't met me before, but have uh, maybe read about this in the program? And I thought, oh, that that seems kind of neat. Uh, and uh, and therefore, you have no idea what you're actually getting yourself into. And so there will be people who will, you know, raise their hands and avert their eyebrows in that way. So um, I would like for you. Uh, at this point, to go ahead and uh, and and enter your uh, your submission right now into the chat window right down here, and you can say what uh, what kind of what kind of uh, person you are. If you are a raucous thunderous applause person, or you can say if you are an awkward raising of the hands and and averting of the eyes uh, kind of person. I think I've, I've met many of the people here. I recognize a lot of the names. Um, one of the people is my agent. I should hope that she has some kind of idea what's going to happen, but we don't know now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, Sarah, we are definitely old friends. I even know your first name. Um, and I, and I signed the book to you with my super gay fabulous pen. I will, uh, I, I will, I will talk about that right now in case I forget at some point. This is my super gay fabulous pen. Uh, it looks like in this window, there is not a direct way for you to make purchases, uh, on my, uh, uh, on my, uh, in my page, in my room on the, uh, on the site. So I'll probably go ahead and put a, a link in there. Hang on. Let me see if I can get, I'm going to, I'm going to do that right now. Give me, give me just a second here. I'm going to put a link, um, to actually, you know what? 
Ginger, would you mind doing that? Would you mind finding my page and putting a link in the comments so that that way anyone who wants to buy any of the things um, will uh, will be able to find it very very easily. All they have to do is like copy that URL and then they can do that and they can they can buy something or they can leave a tip simultaneously while anything is. I'm assuming that you're going to say yes uh, if I and uh, and yes. Oh, um, fabulous, Teresa! You met me in St. Louis last year in April. Oh, I love I love St. Louis, the giant the the giant arc, the triumph. Uh, that's not what it is, but it is rather triumphant. Um, so uh, so yes, big 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 fan of uh, of Saint Louis, um, the the sixteenth, fourteenth. I can't remember which one it is. I like um, there it is. Fabulous! Thank you so much, Ginger. Mwah, I knew there was a reason I liked you. Um, so uh, so let me think. So all right. So some people have said that they know that they they've met me before. Other people haven't uh, haven't responded at all. She was already on it. I've had dates like that. Um, so, uh, so this is, uh, kind of what the, so here's how I usually like to start. All right. I usually like to start, uh, by asking how everyone's feeling today. And you would know, say, you know, Woo! and then I say, that's knowing you're gay enough for what's about to happen. All right. So, uh, so then what I say is here, ask me how I'm doing. And so you would ask me how I'm doing and then I would go fabulous. Right, and so we do the rainbow snap, right? Then I kind of thrust out my hips, I'm like, mm, yeah, it's, a, it's a good. So here, I'm gonna ask you how you're doing, and anytime I ask you how you're doing, you just come in, and, mm, fabulous, and and whether whether I can see you or not, I'm just gonna have to trust that uh, that this is a, a thing that you're going to do. So all right, how are you feeling? Oh, I have never been so proud to look upon my semen. Um, so welcome to the Raunchy Romp with the Raging Queen. This is my poop cabin. Um, now, uh, of course, it's not my actual poop cabin. My actual poop cabin is somewhere uh, on its way home from Mardi Gras. Um, uh, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Francois, it's May. How could they still be on their way home from Mardi Gras? Well, they're still, it's taking them a little bit longer to get home because they're still arguing over who gets to store the beads on the return journey. <clears throat> uh, and if you did not get that joke, then this show is not for you. <laughs> Um, so, um, so anyway, the, the, the structure of this show, all right, uh, I'm going to be reading excerpts from my books, and I have four books. Uh, thank you, Sarah, for saying, oh, look at all these people who are saying fabulous. It's delayed, but it is outstanding. All right. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to be reading excerpts from my four books. The first book, there's semen on the poop deck, right? Damn it. Right. Right there. <laughs> Right there. Uh, the second book by Coxon is bigger than yours. Uh, the third book, Too Many Fingers in the Dyke. <clears throat> that one's more of a horror story. And then the fourth book, My Jewels Are Stuck in a Vice Admiral. All right. And, uh, and normally I would say that, you know, we don't want to read all by myself. You know, I think it's more fun in a group. So, uh, of course, I'm here all by my lonesome right here, except I have all of you people in the chat window right now. So if uh, at some point I say something that you like, you think is funny, go ahead and put a ha-ha. Uh, that way I know that you're laughing and I know that you're having a good time. If you have requests, if you're familiar with the books and there's a particular passage that you might like me to read, I'm a big fan of going into people's passages however they want me to go. So if you're that kind of person, then, uh, you know, then, then please do. Uh, you know, please, please do let me know you want that kind of passage. Um, you know, if you, if there's an excerpt from a particular book that you want, uh, anything like that, you, you feel free. We make this an interactive conversation. I'm 30 seconds ahead of you, but... <laughs> What, you know, who cares? I don't mind, um, you know, I, I don't mind being, you know, being the one in front because that means that you're the one in behind and I like it that way. So, um, so I'm going to start with an excerpt from my first book. This book is called There's Semen on the Poop Deck. Now, this book features me, Francois Lefoutre, on my ship, The Raging Queen, and we are come upon by my arch nemesis and part-time lover, Captain Coxsmith Standish. Coxsmith and his men are all up on my poop deck, right? We're talking semen everywhere. Places even Ginger doesn't want semen to be. They're taking on my semen. They're stuffing us in the fuck so we don't know how we're going to beat everyone off. And uh, and if you want to know how it ends, you're going to have to read the book. Now, um, now I've got, I'm going to go ahead and read 
reading that. So this is actually from the very, very beginning. This is the second page of the whole ser series. Uh, and this is where I am entering my Raging Queen, which is my ship, you understand. I'm going to enter my Raging Queen for the first time. <clears throat> The Raging Queen had two openings. One in the front. At the you can't see it with the semen. Hold on, let me move this way. All right. One in the front, at the mouth of the ship, and the smaller opening at the rear. <laughs> the rear entrance had always been my favorite. The passage was long and narrow with a smooth finish. I am not the largest of men, but even so, it was always a, a tight fit, which made it quite the experience. It was as if, as I entered her, she was... Squeezing me tight, willing me never to go. I ran my hands along her through the length of her corridor, fingering her delicately in a loving embrace. My raging queen moved up and down underneath me, and undulating waves almost shuddering under my touch. You understand that the raging queen is my ship, right? I want to make sure that that's perfectly clear. All right, nothing inappropriate happening. Right, the raging queen is my ship. <clears throat> Moved up and down underneath me and undulating waves almost shuddering under my touch. She creaked and moaned, screamed and gyrated. And though she was for now under the control of my semen, it was I, only I, whose every order she followed. She submitted to me first, always to me. And I liked it that way. Yes, it was safe to say that every time I entered the Raging Queen, I fell in love with her all over again. I took a few steps and then paused a moment. Never wanted to go in too far at once, but to do it slowly, a little bit at a time, build up the anticipation, tease her almost. She moaned louder, bucked harder, screamed with more fury. I had her right where I wanted her. I began to hear the mutterings of the men above me. That might have distracted a lesser man, but to me, it only made me want to go slower. I never shied away from being caught with my raging queen. Finally, with deeper penetration on every step, I reached the poop cabin. Now, who wants to know what happens in the poop cabin, right? <laughs> well, that's the X-rated show. Uh, so I'm not going to do that right now because I don't know who any of you are. I don't know if you're really, really ready for that yet. If you beg me enough, I might tell you what happens in the poop cabin uh, later on. Uh, but you're really going to have to beg me for that one. So uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, uh, anyway, who needs a cigarette? Uh, let's see. Um... Here, let me take a, just a sip of my fluids right now. Mm, mm. Speaking of fluids, here I want to tell you about the about some of my merchandise as well as the the book. So um, so here I have these mugs, uh, which are fabulous for consuming your fluids. It says, "I taste Francois from the tip of my tongue," and then you chug it, and it says to the back of my throat. Right. So that's you know that's that's nice. Um, I also have this. Uh, this fabulous Fleur de Pine tumbler, which is perfect for keeping your fluids hot or cold, depending on your preference. Uh, so yes, if you are uh, if you are in need of some of some quenching, uh, that is a thing that uh, that can be made available to you. Mm. I'm glad that you love this, Sarah. Uh, I I I love giving ple giving you pleasure even though you're a girl. All right, so I'm going to read an excerpt now from the second book. Uh, this book is called um, My Coxswain is Bigger Than Yours. In this one, we discover a bloody dinghy to our rear, and we find out that the Duchess of Dicker has stolen the golden rod and hidden it. Go ahead, ask me where. I'm assuming you're asking me where. In her person. Everyone type, ew. So we have to go to Dicker. We have to seduce the Duchess. We have to extract... <clears throat> We have to extract, extract, and make our way safely back to the Raging Queen. Um, so along the way, on, on, our, on our trip to Dicker, we find a, uh, a taxi driver. Uh, you know, and actually, this one might not be as, uh, uh, no, this, you know, this, this will be fun. All right, um, so, uh, let's see. So we find a taxi driver, um, and, uh, the, the taxi driver is going to take us away to, uh, to, to Dicker, right? So, yeah, I'm just gonna kind of, like, go like this. 
I don't have the right parts underneath me for this to be really fun. But, oh, thank you, Ginger, for saying you. Um, so, uh, 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 alright. <clears throat> so, the Commodore was right. If your goal is to find Dicker, all you have to do is ask. It started with the first person we met, the taxi driver. Uh, he was a short, muscular man, and like many such men, he felt he had something to prove. So when we asked him if he knew his way to Dicker, he said, Of course I know my way to Dicker! I've seen my way around many a Dicker before! And then that's all he talked about on the way up there. Dicker this, and Dicker that! How big Dicker was, how much it had grown, how many ladies he had brought there, etc, etc. He displayed a massive intent on on proving to us just how great his knowledge of Dicker actually was, and every time it appeared, uh, we and as we approached it, every time it appeared from behind a bush or a tree or a garden, uh, we felt the need to point it out to us again, as though we so desperately needed to look at it yet another time. Oh, see how much bigger it is now, he'd say, or, uh, oh, look, it's so much more impressive when you look at it from this angle. Or he'd hold up his hands in a, in a circle and exclaim, look how it fits in my hands. <laughs> Every time, Standish and I would change the subject, but the driver kept on bringing it right back to Dicker, and whenever we'd pass someone on the road, he'd brag about it, shouting, we're going to Dicker, to friends and random passers-by alike. I began to see why so many ladies avoid the place until they're really sure that we, they want to go. The trip took some four hours, and Standish and I having to, to practice quite a bit of tantra in order to last that long. Finally, though, Dicker was right in front of us, growing larger with every step. And we had the pleasure of being fully in its presence. <clears throat> Dramatic page turn. And I have to admit, once we were there, it was quite exciting. A lot of people say it's a little awkward the first time you're in Dicker, but all of the men were out playing, and a few women too, and everyone seemed to be having a good time. The driver dropped us off at a pub called the Cock and Cranny, which is where Standish planned to rendezvous with his men. And, uh, and so it was time for us to find the Duke, which turned out not to be that hard. Uh, it seems that, the, that, like Dicker itself, the Duke was rather a conspicuous fellow, known for showing himself off to anyone and everyone, whether they wanted to see him or not. The fir first person we asked admitted to having seen him on multiple occasions, and the third person we asked uh, had seen him not an hour before on his way into, as luck would have it, the cock and cranny. So into the cranny we went, and there he was, the Lord Dicker himself. He was a strange-looking man, young, hairier than one might expect, not especially attractive, and uh, far below average in both his size and presentation. But nevertheless, I found myself oddly attracted to him, oddly drawn toward him. At this moment, he seemed to be quite broken, and he was crying quite flaccidly uh, into the last of four empty beer mugs that decorated the table in front of him. In that state, all I wanted to do was pick him up. My Lord Dicker, I said, and I, as I sidled up next to him. <laughs> I'm not a lord anymore, he muttered, whining. <laughs> a lord without a staff is no lord. She's a lady. <laughs> now, now, I said, I've known many men who lost their staffs in battle. There's still men, every one. They're just bottoms now. The Duke burst into tears like that. <laughs> Clearly, we were getting off on the wrong side of the bedsheets. I had expected, uh, given where we were and his reputation, that he would have even less modesty than, I don't know, an Olympian at a mud wrestling contest. But now I could see he was a sensitive soul who needed to be handled much more delicately and teased out of his shell. I donned my most sympathetic voice. Look, I said, touching my hand to his. Don't you worry. I will find your golden rod, and I will bring it back to you. The physical contact seemed to do him some good. He perked up a little bit, looked down at my hand, and then up at my face. Meeting me eye to eye for the first time, there was a sadness in him. A deep sense of longing in the attention excited but confused him. It became obvious to me then that he had never played Joy Boy before. 
had no doubt wanted to, had been Ethel many times in his games of Romeo and Ethel, the pirate's daughter, but felt he was honor-bound by his station to resist temptation, or some such nonsense. But here was a man, touching his hand, offering some measure of compassion, at a time when he was feeling particularly vulnerable. I watched him get a look in his eye that resembled hope. How? he asked. How will you get it back? <laughs> <clears throat> and I think I will leave you off there. If you want to know how, we will leave <clears throat> leave each other off. <clears throat> so I'm going to actually read a little bit of an excerpt a little while later. Uh, and this is um, uh, an excerpt from a, a section. Uh, so this is a chapter called The Rainbow Privateer. And I actually have some, uh, some, some music here. Uh, I'm going to play it. And I want you to tell me when I play this right now, if you can actually hear me, talk, hear the music reasonably at, the, at a reasonable volume uh, and hear me talking at a reasonable volume or if the music is too loud or if it's too distracting or anything like that. All right. So now I'm just turned it off. And, uh, and, uh, and now, so tell me if you heard that all right. And uh, in the meantime, while I'm waiting for you to answer, I'm going to explain to you a little bit about what it is that you were listening to just then. So uh, as we're going through the streets of Dicker, we come upon a club called the Rainbow Privateer. And um, uh, on the Rainbow Privateer, um, there's, a, has a, there's a sign that features a pirate who is nude, but for a strategically positioned hat, right? So kind of like... Right? Just like that. Okay. Um, so, you know, it occurs to me I totally could have actually been, uh, been, thank you so much, Dirk. I think you're amazing. I, <laughs> I think that, all right, Ginger says the music was too loud. All right. So here, I'll turn the music down a little bit. Uh, let me see. All right. Here. All right. I'm going to try playing it again, and you can tell me uh, how the volume is now. Uh, so tell me about this, tell me if you can kind of hear it okay. I mean, it's supposed to be loud music, um, because it's a club, but, uh, alright. So tell me, tell me how, how that volume was, whether you could hear it okay, but it wasn't too distracting. Alright. Um, so, uh, alright. So yes, so the, the, uh, the club is called the Rainbow Privateer. It features a sign, uh, it features a pirate, uh, the sign features a pirate who is, uh, nude, but for a strategically positioned hat, and it bear, bore, bears color uh, colors consistent with the club's namesake, right? So it's a, a hat with rainbow colors coming out of it, right? And uh, and there is drum and balalaika music playing, uh, which was the music that I was just uh, just getting ready to play for you just then. Uh, a little better, still made you muffled. Well, that's unfortunate. Uh, that was better, but still kind of distracting. All right. Well, you know what? So it's drum and bali like a music. I'm going to play it loud. You can hear it a little bit. This is what drum and bali like a music sounds like. All right. So you can just assume that that's playing on a loop. Well, when it's like it's supposed to be super loud because it's a club. Right. So here I'm going to uh, I'm going to, to, to share with you the uh, the details of this of this club. Um, and, uh, and then in the meantime, actually, I'm going to, uh, to, to re, uh, yes. All right. Well, no, I'm not going to do that. Um, uh, so, all right. Uh, so yes, so that's the music. Um, and so, uh, so this is what happens when we walk into that club. All right. <clears throat> now I've partied plenty in my life. My 10th birthday, my father gave me a pony cask of Chimay and a lambskin condom and told me not to do anything stupid. I woke up the next morning in a pile of manure, three miles from home, covered in some fungus that eventually had to be treated by an eastern shaman. In the decades since, I've eaten mushrooms with princes, sat with African tribesmen, and smoked plants that even they couldn't identify. Uh, uh, Gone to bed with more men at once than I could count on all my body's protrusions, and consumed so many different kinds of bodily excretions that if you baked me at 375 degrees for an hour, I would probably turn into a cake. <laughs> a fruit cake. <laughs> but never in my life have I experienced something quite like that club. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> the drum and bali like was played through a series of horn-like devices, which amplified the music to a volume so loud it might have crushed a lesser man's brain. Hanging from the ceiling was a glass ball faceted with mirrors, which reflected multicolored lights which shone from torches uh, that reflected the multicolored lights that shone from torches at every angle. The ball was rotating, creating this sort of psychedelic rainbow effect which you could spend hours watching. On top of the bar, men were dancing. Not just men, but muscled men, almost entirely naked. Their whole body is oiled and glistening in the firelight, wearing nothing but a leather pouch to hold their gyrating giggle sticks on the, pl on the floor. People danced with each other in costumes the variety of which I had never before seen. Some wearing regalia that matched the opposite gender and wearing it so well that mistakes must have been quite common. Others wearing assless hosen, leather naval uniforms, people dressed up as ponies being smacked by riding crops, and men quite nearly as naked as the bar dancers, everyone grinding up against each other as if they are, and uh, so vigorously that they all looked as if they had three legs. I stood for a long while, taking in the sight, until a man dressed as a police officer shoved past me and joined in the dancing. I picked up the off the floor, put a hand on the shoulder of one of my petty officers, and told him, I'm home. The next several hours were something of a blur. The drug we bought off the street before we entered the club kicked in, and all I remember doing the whole time was dancing, sucking on a pacifier, and waving about the same set of ingenious glass sticks that had a temperate, constant, slow-burning ember glowing inside. Every now and then I'd see the Duchess and remember the, the mission for which I had ostensibly come to this entrancing heaven. But then some twink would rub up against me and I'd yield my attention to his far more pressing matters. Some indeterminate period of time later, I snapped rather suddenly back into reality. By this time, my head was throbbing. Sorry. By this time, my head was throbbing. <clears throat> I'd sweat through every article of clothing, and I'd stained my hose in, in at least four different places. Then some cacophony began ringing in my ears, uh, an alarm, a siren. At first it seemed to fit quite perfectly with the tone of the music, but when bells followed and people started to rush outside and then the music stopped but the sirens and bells continued, I had to regain my sensibilities. Having no clue how long it had been since I'd seen the Duchess, I followed the crowd out of the Rainbow Privateer and onto the streets of Dicker. The sun was about to rise. <clears throat> And we could see the light beginning to come up in the direction of the Dicker Chateau to the east. Everyone was running in that direction, and I worked my way through them, seeing if I could locate her. But then I noticed the sun also rising in the back of the privateer, in the opposite direction. I looked back and forth, found Venus up in the night sky, made a quick calculation, and then realized the Dicker Chateau wasn't to the east at all. It was on fire. There you go. All right, so that's that section. Hang on. I caught something. Not the syphilis. <laughs> all right. Uh, better. Still in my, all right. Um, all right. So glad that you liked that. So those are some fun parts. I don't want to give away the entire story, but uh, but that was uh, those those were a few excerpts from that second book. Uh, Ginger, if you don't mind reposting that uh, the link so that anyone who. Uh, uh, who wants any of the merchandise right now. So all of these books, again, are available at, uh, at our page. Um, or at my at, at my at my page in my in my room. Um, so the the books um, they do get progressively thicker and therefore more pleasurable as they go on. So they're uh, they're it's five for the first one, six for the second. Uh, then the third book is called Too Many Fingers in the Dike, obviously a horror story. Uh, that one's seven, and then uh, and then eight uh, is for my jewels are stuck in a vice admiral. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. That one is an uncomfortable read, but I find if you just breathe through it, it's actually somewhat pleasurable. Um, so yes, they go five, six, seven, and eight. For an extra dollar, you can get them signed. And uh, yeah, so I'll just, I'll, 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 and I do it with my super gay fabulous pen. If you didn't see me talk about this, so I use real quill and ink. So I get my ink all over your, um, uh, all, so, so I get my ink all over your, your, your pages. And uh, and yes, I'll, so I'll, I can autograph it to you as well. Um, I also have 
lots of merchandise there. I have this special merchandise that is only available uh, this weekend, uh, unless I sell a bunch of them. Uh, and so this says, spread the love, not the coronavirus. So normally, you'll see normally it says spread the love, not the syphilis. That's one of my catchphrases. Uh, for this weekend only, it's saying spread the love, not the coronavirus. Uh, I also have, uh, oh yes, and then, so Ginger is also saying buy them all. So they're five, six, seven, and eight, but you get all four for 20. Um, so uh, if you, because when you're getting four play, you want to get off, right? Um, so it's four for 20, and then I think it's, it's either 25 or 30 to get all of them signed as well. Uh, and yes, uh, I do actually have audio books as well. I don't know if there is a way for me to sell them through here, so I don't actually have uh, have that set up. But they are available on Audible, uh, and they are available at uh, on CD Baby. Um, if you uh, if you go to uh, to the website, you can you, uh, to my website, you can buy them there. Um, so uh, so yes, the audio audio books are available as well. I know I'm not supposed to be selling things that aren't on, on here, but uh, I will don't don't worry, Ginger. I will I will kick you back uh, if if I sell an audio book this weekend. Um, so uh, so yes, yeah, so that's nice. So then you can hear me deliver my entire semen sexology orally if you're getting the audio book. Uh, I'm also holding up the Fleur de Pin handkerchief. All right, this is fully customizable. I can make it any color you want. This one is kind of a striped pink color, all right, because, you know, syphilis. Uh, but yes, you can actually get these monograms as well. So you can get have your initials right here. This could be, hang on, this could be you, right, with the peen going right up in the middle of you. Um, so those are 20 or uh, 25 or 15 or 20 monogrammed. Uh, and you can get them any color you want uh, and, and anything like that. And these are just perfect for uh, cleaning up any messes that can, might arise from reading the books. Dirk says, I can sell the, um, the audio books on here. I am, uh, I am not in, uh, entirely certain how that goes. It's honestly it's something that I mostly just forgot about. But uh, yes, the, corona sh the coronavirus shirt is available as a, tank, uh, as a tank top. If you click, if you look for it in the, uh, in the gallery, um, yes, I am, I am selling it as a, uh, as a tank top. And honestly, I'm actually, these, most of my shirts I, I screen print and so I'm doing a bunch of them at once. These I'm actually just, uh, just doing one at a time because because uh, we're not doing a ton of them. Uh, so, so if you want something else, like a different shape, uh, a V-neck or whatever, I could do that too. Uh, just, just ask. Uh, thank you. Yes, the hanky is amazing, and it's so nice and soft, and it just it makes you feel. Look, see, I can get, I can get my my pain in my mouth. Um, uh, so yes, those are the things. So Dirk, we'll have to talk later about how to get the audio books on here as well. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but yes, in the meantime, don't you worry. I will, I will make sure everyone, if I sell any audiobooks this weekend, I'll make sure everyone gets paid for it. Uh, so in the meantime, hold on, I'm just gonna, gonna drink some more of this. What time is it? 9.30. We've still got about half an hour. Uh, Mike says we can work on that later. Fabulous. Uh, all right. <clears throat> um... Let's see. So I think it's time for the ladies to get involved. What do you say? Considering most of the people in this room are female, uh, we're, we're going to get the ladies involved. Uh, all right. I'm not going to lie. This excerpt can get uncomfortable at times. Stick with me, okay? Uh, it, it, will, <laughs> it, will, it will get uncomfortable. I will, I'm not going to... I'll, I'll explain as it goes on. So this is the third book in the series, too many fingers in the dike. I'm going to read from the very the very first chapter in this book is what I am going to read. Um, uh, don't don't I am not worried, Dirk. I know that you people will take care of me, and you know that I will take care of you. I love you guys. Thank you so much for putting on such an amazing event, and thank you for giving me the anchor spot, so to speak, in, uh, in at uh, at this time uh, on Saturday night. <clears throat> So, uh, this chapter is called You See Twat. Uh, and uh, this book takes place in the Netherlands. It's Too Many Fingers in the Dike. Here, I'll put, uh, I'll put, this, I'll put this one up right here. There we go. Um, so, uh, uh, <clears throat> the first time I saw the Netherlands up close, I confess I was not terribly impressed. 
At first, my hesitation was purely aesthetic, you understand. At the north end is a, a peninsula that juts forth into the North Sea, and off the coast of that peninsula is an archipelago that extends north and to the east. Altogether, the grouping looks not unlike um, an uncircumcised leprous phallus ejaculating onto the back of Europe. I will pause now while all of you go to Google Maps, look up the Netherlands, look at a map of it to see that, it, yes, it actually does look like an uncircumcised leprous phallus ejaculating onto the back of Europe. <clears throat> this is me pausing while you do that. This is actually a true story. One time I was reading this to someone uh, from the Netherlands, right, a, a Dutch person, and I, and I read that segment, uh, that section, and I could see the gears turning in his head. He goes, oh, I just ruined his homeland for him. <clears throat> The diagnosis is not entirely inappropriate given the rate of unwanted fluids constantly entering the Dutch mainland. You see, the Netherlands are not called that because they are geographically south of anything, but rather because a great portion of them lies below sea level. They used to be so swampy that no one would ever go there, and even those brave souls that attempted to descend into the swampy bogs would invariably turn tail the, and head to high ground the minute they caught whiff of the smell. I mean, <laughs> who could blame them? The place was so unclean. Ironically, though, the bogs that made the Netherlands so malodorous also made them remarkably fertile, and so people were innately attracted to the Netherlands, braving the swamps to plant their seed wherever they could find the slightest agreement. And for their troubles, they were greatly rewarded. Plants grew, populations grew, soon covering every inch of the bogs. Nevertheless, the, ne the Netherlands' constantly swelling tides presented challenges. The whole place stank of rotten fish and was prone to gush forth at the slightest provocation. In fact, to this day, its waters continue to explode on itself with some regularity. For that reason, the people of the Netherlands saw it fit to populate their country with a great many dykes, whose job is to withhold the gushing of the North Sea and prevent its unwanted intrusion. Today, the Netherlands boasts the world's largest population of dykes. Collectively, they are known as the Great Dyke Army for their massive... They are impenetrable, and they have never once lost a battle against the bounding main that constantly threatens to maraud their master. Now, the first island in the aforementioned ejaculate archipelago is far and away the largest, and at the northern end of that island is a small village called De Coxdorp. That's actually true. Actually, the northernmost town on the first island in the ar archipelago is actually called De Coxdorp. Look it up. <clears throat> a small village called De Coxdorp whose dikes are known as cock-blocks for obvious reasons. That part's not true. And cockles, what the people of de Coxdorp call themselves, refer to their northernmost cock-block as UC's cock, after the cock-blocker UC Twat, whose job was to mind it. And so, here we begin our tale, in bed with his so-called UC Twat, on a dank, dark mor morning, cold but humid like so many mornings in the area. Yussi Twat was sound asleep, hands between her legs, dreaming of a yodeler with bright red lipstick doing extraordinary things with her mouth and tongue. As she rised, she noticed a wetness in the general area of her nether re re regions. <clears throat> Given the dream that had ravaged her sleep, the reaction was uh, neither unexpected nor unwelcome, uh, though she did notice it was quite a gush more considerable than normal. It wasn't just the space between her legs that was wet, it was her whole thigh and the sheets too, and some areas were so sticky they must have been that way for hours. Well, she thought, I haven't had that experience since I first learned to ride a bicycle. <clears throat> she clamped her legs tight around her hand. By the way, one point uh, I had a, uh, a, a lesbian bought this book from me, and then she asked me, after she bought it, she asked me, what qualifies you to write a, uh, a lesbian romance novel? And the answer that I gave her was absolutely nothing. <clears throat> and she said that was a great answer, by the way. She liked that answer. So <clears throat> she clamped her legs tight around her hand and began to rub the blade of her wrist against her snapper. <clears throat> she pestled her mortar with growing enthusiasm, and the pie's juices flowed hotter. She worked up quite the lather. It wouldn't be long to squeeze 
the coal. It wouldn't take her long to squeeze the coal, coal into a di into a diamond. Sorry, I messed that up. It wouldn't take her long to squeeze the coal into a diamond. When she rolled onto her back and opened her legs, though, you see immediately notice the strong and unmistakable smell of iron. <clears throat> now, this is where I said, when I said a moment ago that this is going to get uncomfortable for a minute, I'm going to tell you, true story, I performed this, I read this section at a, at a show called Kinky Renaissance Festival, and at a show called Texas Kink Fest, and even when I got to that, that part, at those shows, even they said, oh, even they were uncomfortable with it. Bear with me. I promise it will all work out in the end. <clears throat> <clears throat> Surprised though she was, she wasn't expecting high tide for almost a week, and she was no stranger to vampire foreplay, so she simply rallied herself to move from the one-handed waltz to the two-finger tango, figuring the mess was already made, she might as well enjoy herself and worry about cleaning it up later. That's strange, she thought. Why can't I feel my finger? Her thoughts shifted, the wrong way down the spectrum from arousal to curiosity, but the first physical sensation she felt when the carpal knuckle made, was when the carpal knuckle made contact with the mound of her danger clam. One of my favorite euphemisms, danger clam. <clears throat> my other favorite euphemism, thunder muffin. <clears throat> <clears throat> shooting a sharp current of lightning violently through her arm, which reflexively co recoiled in shock. She fumbled with the sheets, scraping the same knuckle as she did so, and again feeling a current of raw nerve endings firing through her arm. All thoughts of beaver dancing were long behind her now. She threw off the tangled sheets, wet and sticky from dried blood, and exposed her body to the frigid cold, looking first at her legs, then her crotch, before settling on her hand, what she knew to be the real source of her distress. The forefinger of her right hand, the forefinger of her right hand had been severed. Hold on, I need to find my spot again. All right, there it is. The forefinger of her right hand had been severed, leaving the stump that remained raw and serrated as if it had been gnawed off by a wolf. Dark red clotted blood appeared where her finger should have been, the scab partially torn off by her recent gesticulating. The reopened wound oozed blood, but it was a trifling amount compared to the quantity of sanguine fluid that covered every inch of the bed and herself. Her mouth agape. Yussi struggled to draw in a full breath. She coughed, <coughs> sputtered, <coughs> choked. Then, when she expanded her lungs successfully, she screamed. <coughs> I'm not going to do a scream. There are kids sleeping in the house next door. But, uh, ooh, <clears throat> My throat, Danger Clam and Thunder Muffin. I know that's the name of my of uh, of my all girl band. When I join one, <clears throat> Ginger, you need to be the manager of a uh, uh, <laughs> the manager of an or an agent of an all girl band named Thunder Muffin and Danger Clam. It'll be perfect. It's like uh, they'll be like Garfunkel and Oates, uh, <laughs> but even more vulgar if you can imagine it. Um, so, uh, let's see. I think, I'm trying to think. Huh? Let's see, what uh, what time is it? It is 9.44. Um, I think... So, uh, let's see. I might have time for one, uh, for one or two more. Well, I might have time for one more before I, uh, before I do my, my, uh, my closing song. I actually, um, let's see. Uh... <clears throat> Yeah, so I'm going to do an excerpt here uh, from uh, from book four. My jewels are stuck in a vice admiral. Um, by the way, I haven't... Have I shown you all of the... Yeah, you know what? Whatever. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll keep on. <laughs> you know, yes, Sarah wants to be a joint manager of Thunder Muffin. One of you can manage Danger Clam, and one of you can mo manage Thunder, Thunder Muffin. Uh, I think of the Houston rapper Megan the Stallion. All right, I'll check it out. Uh, Ginger, if you could go ahead and and uh, and post another link to the um, uh, to to my page, so people uh, people can find that. Um, and because uh, we're we're almost done here, thank you. Um, so uh, this book, my jewels are stuck in a vice admiral. In this one, the head of the whole of the French Navy, whose name is Jacques Offiedic. Uh, we call him Jacoff for short. Uh, his ship gets stolen from the harbor at Brest. By the way, Brest, 
Also, real name, real place name, also, and I'm not even making this up, it is the French Naval Headquarters. Um, so, um, uh, so the, the, the Jacoff, that, that's, he, that's not actually a real person, uh, his ship gets stolen, uh, from the harbor at Brest, and his ship is a pinnace, because of course it is, and because he's the head of the French Navy, it's a big, important pinnace, and, uh, deep within the, those, that pinnace are a set of drawers, and we have been tasked with, uh, with finding those drawers. Um... So, uh, so here, we're, so we find, we actually find the ship, uh, fairly quickly. This is page eight of the book. And, uh, and I, you know, and I go in and I go into the, uh, the, 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 the cabin where, where he is. And, uh, let's see, uh, you know, I, I'm not convinced that this excerpt is going to be good in this, uh, and then let me see what else we have, uh, let me see. I'll, I'll try. I might try a different a, a different section. Uh, uh, hang on. Oh, you know what? This one. This one might be good. All right. So scratch that. Well, actually, so all of those things happen. I'm going to read something from a little bit later in the book. Um, uh, these are great reads. Chuckle the entire time you're reading. Don't read these in bed, or maybe you should definitely read them in bed. They'll keep you up at night. Um, so, uh, let's see. So we go, so we, um, uh, uh, so I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying to think what you need to know in order to do this. So we've got, uh, there's a character who we meet in the third book whose name is Randy Butterbottom. And, uh, and we come back and find him again. He's the Baron of Cockfosters. And so we go to find him in Cockfosters, um, uh, and, uh, in order to help us in our mission, our mission becomes to find the King Key Sextant, which is a strange and bizarre type of sextant, right? People do unspeakable things when they're having the King Key Sextant. Um, and so we have to try and locate the King Key Sextant, and I'm going to find Randy Butterbottom is going to help me locate the King Key Sextant. Um, and, uh, and he wants us to go find... A, uh, a, a mystic whose name is the Oracocro. So this is a section where we are going to the Oracocro. <clears throat> the Oracocro, it turned out, was a great bustard, a brand of avian, native to southern and central Europe, whose facial feathers resembled a Fu Manchu and who was therefore presumed to have mystical powers. This particular bustard prophesied from a sacred temple called Coxwell, again, real place, a few miles from Randy's home. Legend had it that this strange bustard was at the source of Julius Caesar's drive to invade the British Isles. Caesar, wanting to prove that Rome and not Delphi was at the center of the world, intended to release two eagles to circumnavigate the globe. But since he couldn't find any eagles, he did it instead with a pair of bustards. Bustards, however, are notoriously uncooperative and prone to dementia. The female immediately died of syphilis, while the male traveled due northwest, and it was Caesar's attempts to define the degenerate bustard that met with such resistance from everyone he attempted to probe. Thus he came, thus he saw, and thus he conquered most enthusiastically, all in search of some enigmatic bustard. He finally found the bird in the middle of an otherwise unremarkable chicken farm in a grassland to the north of what would eventually become London. It was perched on top of a well, surrounded by thousands of fowl, and the farmer who owned the land reported that it had been perched in that spot for a decade, no matter how hard he tried to remove it. If he caged it, his well would dry up and his crops would die until the bustard escaped and made its way back to that same spot. At that point, the well would fill up again and his crops would once again grow. One time he tried to kill it, for days afterward his chickens mysteriously died. Then one day the buster's reanimated corpse was there on the well again, and his chickens became ever more productive. So while he couldn't find a way to get rid of the stubborn bustard, he now saw it as a sign of good luck, and he kept it there. <clears throat> Naturally, Caesar killed the farmer, took his land, established the prime meridian, and built a monument around the cock's well. Hence, cock's well. The monument itself was simple made from hollybush sandstone, which has a dark greenish-gray color and held a, flat, a fat conical shape, some 50 yards, blah, 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 blah. All right, so we're going, oh, here we go. <clears throat> there was a mystical fog curling out from the mo monument's opening, which I admit gave me some pause, since the last time I'd seen fog quite so thick it had violated me mercilessly. You'll have to find the third, read the third book to, to, to find out about that. But Randy ushered me inside the Coxwell Monument, spurred forth by the cooing of the Oracocrel itself. When I was hit by the blind wetness of the mist, I was reminded of the 
Friday night foam parties we have inside our fucksel, and my inhibitions immediately started to give way. So I followed, eagerly. Our way to the center was guided by the rank odor of bird droppings that got st stronger the deeper we went in. Eventually, the fog broke to expose the famous well. Randy got on his knees in front of the bird and motioned for me to do the same. We come on our knees with great circumspection to worship at the Coxwell. Please, or cockerel, fill us with your wisdom. <clears throat> The orcaco responded with a noise that sounded like someone farting through a kazoo. I should pause here so that you can actually look up what a an, uh, a, uh, a a great bustard sounds like. No shit, that's what a great bustard sounds like. <laughs> sounds like someone farting through a kazoo. All right. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, uh... We will drink your juice, or a cockerel, Randy said. We will swallow it all so that we may know a taste of the or a cockerel's essence. <laughs> Randy opened his eyes, and uh, keeping his head bowed, he tilted his head in my general direction. Uh, I, I didn't understand at first, but after he repeated the notion, I realized he was pointing to a hand crank next to me. So I crank it up, uh, there's a pouch in there, I drink the, the liquid that's in there, and as I drink, uh, I began to hear this, uh, this low, trilly voice going, Yes, that's right! Swallow it all! Very good! <clears throat> Thank you, or cockerel, for giving us your serum, the milk of the Coxwell. For <clears throat> pleasure! <laughs> Hang on. For <clears throat> pleasure lies with the birds! Um, you're not going to be able to... The pleasure lies with the birds and the bees! I looked around, but the only thing I saw was the bird pooping, the filthy bustard. But then I heard the voice again. It seems old age and continence decrees. Is that? I looked at the bird. Did you? Pray, seek thou not temptation, waste with twimps. My time tis not for me but fleeting glimpse. Pray tell me now the quest on which you seek, my chin to raise and to open upon thy beak. And now I'm like, what the hell was in that water, right? And Randy's like, I am here in the presence of Francois Lefoutre, who seeks a strange and mysterious item known as the King Key Sextant. He has requested my assistance, but I am conflicted. I've never ventured that far out of my comfort zone. I'm quite vanilla, truth be told. The orc cockerel turned around a few times, did a few squats, thrust its hips out, and then opened its mouth to speak. I no longer heard the kazoo sound, though, but its voice... Clear as duck butter. <clears throat> the syrup till tis vanilla, much in taste, but spirit tis a syrup which to base thy life in meaning. Be thou not such fool to miss a chance to worship at the jewel. Now I don't know what the hell is going on, right? So I'm like, uh, you know, uh, so so I ask a bunch of questions, right? And then the voice says. <clears throat> The queen from Fontenay! That's me, I'm from Fontenay. I'm the queen from Fontenay. The queen from Fontenay has much to give. Its legacy, its life, it will outlive. Nay, look thou not in place unnatural. Thy jewel is stuck in an admiral. I raised my head to give my full attention for the first time now to the Oracocron. I'm sorry, can, can you say that one more time? <clears throat> the bird flapped its wings again and began humping the ground. The queen from Fontenay! No, 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 I heard that part. What I'm, I, I'm asking, I'm like, the part about, did you say the kinky sextant is in a vice admiral? Your cockerel's ethereal voice goes, Thinks thou who frolics gaily, daily game, canst thou avoid? Twill lavish thee with shame, thy quest and life with choices radical. I thee, thy jewels in an admiral. I nodded my head. I didn't really understand what the hell the impenetrable bustard was saying, but the last part was pretty clear. My jewel is stuck in a vice admiral. Thy jewel is stuck in a vice admiral. Son of a bitch! <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, so that's that. 
Um, it's a little bit weird, I know, but uh, but it all kind of makes sense at some point, and it, and I think it's a little bit literary, you know, honestly. Like I, like I wrote, it's in that iambic pentameter. Uh, this one also has drawings in it. Hang on, uh, let me think. So uh, so here's here's a, here's a nice drawing in this book. Um, so um, so yes, I thought normally I uh, I would end this with uh, with a song. Um, actually, you know what? I'll go ahead and end this with a song from this book as well. So, uh, <clears throat> let me, let me think, hang on, let me, let me find, I've got, a, I've got a book here. Hang on one sec. Let me see if I've got, so once again, um, uh, please visit, feel free to, uh, to drop me a tip if you enjoyed the show. I accept your big fat, now, here's the thing, believe it or not, this is what I do for a living. <laughs> I know. My parents are so proud. Um, so please uh, do fill me with your big fat tip if you enjoyed the show. Um, you know, as with everything, the bigger the tip you put in, the more pleasure you get out. That's actually not even true in this situation. But uh, uh, but maybe the bigger the pleasure I gave you, the bigger the tip you can put in. Uh, feel free to buy any of the merchandise. Feel free to, uh, you know, ask for autographs or whatever else. Um, so now I'm going to do a uh, a, a song here. Um, let me see, um, uh, hang on, uh, oh, Mel, they don't have it, I don't have it, oh, never mind, all right, um, all right, never mind, so, uh, I will sing a song real quick, now, this is a famous song, and so, some people, <laughs> hey Proctor, I'm not ready for this, and it's been a great laugh, especially with everything that's going on. I'm glad I'm going to, so come back to this this site. I'll probably do this show or some variation of this show um, on this site once a week from here on out, because why the hell not? I'm not sure what day a week I'll do it on, but uh, but do that. Uh, oh, also notice, uh, if you look here, there's kind of a scrolling thing right here with uh, with the various um, the, the websites and all these other things. So subscribe to uh, to me on the YouTube. You can become a salty seaman, so you get to f hear about all the comings and goings, mostly the comings of Francois Lafoutre. So I'll be doing... Um, uh, that's the email list, and you can get all of that if you go to the website, which is semensexology.com. That's S-E-A-M-E-N, sexology. Make sure you get your E's and your A's right. It can get very awkward very quickly, right? So uh, I've got the one minute left. I'm going to do a, a very, very quick version of this song. Uh, it's called Friggin' in the Riggin', um, uh, but uh, but we do our own version of it. We go, "'Twas on the raging queen, the nights you should, the sights you should have seen. The men would neck on the old poop deck, and the flag was a fleur de pin. The, friend, the captain was Le Foutre, he, the world's most fearsome fruitre. His ship was filled with seamen skilled in finding his poop shooter. "'Twas on the raging queen. The sights you should have seen. The men would neck on the old poop deck, and the flag was a fleur de pin. Um, the our the bowliner was Dachshund. He was strong as two oxen. He could lift a ton with just one thumb, but he couldn't lift my coxswain. My coxswain was a very large individual. Twas on the raging queen. The sights you should have seen. The men would neck on the old poop deck, and the flag was a fleur de pin. The chef's name it was Davy. Had twelve years in the navy. His meat was rare beyond compare, but you should try his gravy. Twas on the raging queen. The sights you should have seen the men would neck on the old poop deck and the flag was a fleur de pin um uh, the navigator's famous he was no ignoramus on nights both clear or dark and dreary could always find uranus Twas on the raging queen the sights you should have seen the men would neck on the old poop deck and the flag was a fleur de pin um I got all kinds of verses for this. I don't have enough time now. Um, so, um, let's see. Well, how do I want to finish it? Uh, I'm going to finish it with something that's really, really vulgar. Uh, but this is one of my favorite. Uh, oh, no, it's ended. Oh, no.